participants. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, great thing to do while you're waiting is to think of a uh, maybe a, a memory you have as a as a child being in a garden or where something was growing, some kind of experience with seeing things grow as a child. What was that like? Yes, I believe a link to the recording will be sent out in the follow-up email along with the link to our resources for you. Almost ready to get started. I see we have we have 19 participants right now. Great. Okay. All right. Well, let's get rolling, everybody. This is Amy from Life Lab, and super glad that you're all here with us. Um, this is the first of four installments in our new family gardening series. Uh, winter is a really great time to start dreaming and planning for what you could grow this year. Um, and so, in this webinar, we're going to be covering um, dreaming and planning for your garden and nature journaling is part of that. Um, where you can plant things, um, you know, how to choose a garden spot in the ground or creative container options for where you could plant. Um, we're going to be watching a, a science-based video on um, checking out your soil in your garden and then um, doing some talking about how to enrich your soil with kids. Um, what you can plant now starting in the winter time, at least on our mild central coast um, climate. And, um, and how to start if you want to grow your own starts, how to grow some starts for your early spring garden. And then we'll talk about what's coming up next and leave some time for questions at the end. So super glad you're here with us today. Um, we know that there's probably a real range of experiences in the group that's here from um, everything from people who've gardened for many years, um, people who've gardened for many years and maybe haven't with kids yet, um, or people who are just beginning to be interested in gardening. Um, and we know also that there are many garden methods in the world. So we'll be um, presenting you with some that we've found work really well for us here in this um, central coast climate. And that also can be adapted to using in other climates as well. Um, let's see, you can pop your questions in the chat anytime. Um, and we may be able to answer some of them during the presentation and we'll try to finish up answering them at the end. Okay, I think we are ready to turn this over to Jennifer for garden planning and nature journaling. We have quite a variety of, of Life Lab staff presenting today. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer, and this is I'm Eleanor. Eleanor, and we are here to present to you nature journaling our spring garden. So, we want to, our family nature journals a lot, and we wanted to share specifically how we would plan a spring garden with nature journaling. So um, that's what we're going to do. And Eleanor, what is nature journaling? It's when you go out in nature and if it's raining, um, you watch nature. You watch nature from inside and nature journaling. If it's raining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then we, so nature journaling uh, in essence is uh, you have a journal and you take it wherever you go. So we have a kit that we take camping and hiking. And like Eleanor was saying, on a rainy day, we'll sit at the window. Um, you can buy them from a store, a couple of different options of buying them from a store. But the most fun thing to do is you can also, you can make them. Uh, making them with a stick, that's in uh, rubber bands. the book of gardening with kids and rubber bands. Um, you can also use paper if you don't have, um, books, or if staples. you haven't made them, you need staples as well. So yeah, so those are lots of different examples of nature journals. Eleanor is going to show you the stapler that she used. And then Eleanor, who can nature journal? Anyone. Anyone, all ages, right? Mm -hmm. You started when you were 
two and a half or three, something like that. And the beauty of it is that it's for everyone. You can take it anywhere. Um, in the resource page that we'll give you, there's a, there's a link on how to create a basic kit. But for now, we're gonna show you a little bit about what we did. So I said to Eleanor at first, I said, let's uh, nature journal our dream garden. So if you could dream up a garden, anything that you'd want um, in your garden, whether it can happen or not, let's just dream, let's dream big. And this is what Eleanor came up with. And so do you wanna so just right, tell them a few things? That okay, you so right there is my Venus flytrap. Okay. Up here, I like this part, you go down the ladder, and then there's a plant growing on the branch in a pot. Uh -huh. Up here's the birdhouse. And right here is a treehouse, a long, long ladder. A really long ladder. Okay. That's a worm box over there. Mm -hmm. And this is a strawberry patch. Those are... Um, That's your nasturtium patch? Yeah. yeah. And of course, then, we have the sun shining down on everything. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then this is the treehouse. Yeah, so Eleanor did her dream garden. And so that's one of the ways that we planned our garden. And then what I did alongside, that's the beauty of nature journaling, is I just started nature journaling our garden that we are growing. And I started painting and drawing and writing out what they are, kale and chard um, and some sweet peas and some carrots. So we just started painting. We left it out. We would come back to it. Oh, Eleanor wants to show you. Yep, we studied some seed packets and we're studying about monarchs and whether it's good to plant milkweed or not right here on the coast. We had seed packets. Yep. Um, and so the other thing is, Eleanor, would you like to show? Oops. Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to show you for a moment right here. This is a nature journal that Eleanor uh, made called Gardening with Kids with some activities. Kara and Grace are actually next going to show you all the different places that a garden can grow. But Eleanor, this one, I haven't made the whole thing yet. So. That's on, what's that on? Compost. Compost. Okay. okay, so this is how to make sour grass. Um, Here, how, why, don't I, why don't I hold it? And you okay, can that's how to make sour grass paint, uh -huh. pick it, separate the stems from the leaves, okay. blend it. Okay, so then... It's more of that. There's only little flaps that say paint and also paint. Okay. And, and then, then sowing seeds. Sowing seeds says what you can sow seeds in. Which in also we'll paint. learn more about later. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then an, an, an activity about doing what? Um, seed mosaic. That's this right. whole thing is. Yeah. So Eleanor made this with a stapler and paper. So those are some activities. All of the activities we did in the resource page, you'll be able to find more about um, the materials that you would need, the book of gardening with kids. Um, and then I just wanted to say a few uh, more things about it. So we nature journal a lot. Sometimes I just sit down and start doing it or I'll put all the materials out and then Eleanor sees it, gets really excited and just comes over and starts, um, and starts doing it. And, one of, the one, one of the things that I love about it is um, think of it as the beauty of imperfection, that it's never perfect. It's just about the process. It's about doing it together. Um, just start and the kiddos will follow. Have fun. And yeah. What do you want to say? Nothing. Oh, okay. Um, and let's see. So next, Grace and Kara are going to share with us all of the different places that a garden can grow. So thanks for I'm listening. Seven. And Eleanor is seven. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Eleanor. And oh, wouldn't you just know it that my phone would go off right as I'm presenting? Um, well, I'm Kara Wild Sundell. I'm the uh, garden programs manager at Life Lab and uh, co presenting with Grace. Hey, I'm Grace Greenfield, and I'm one of the garden educators here at Life Lab. And you can go to the next slide. We are gonna be talking about planting. And so now that we've gotten to dream up our plants with Eleanor and Jennifer it, and dream up what our gardens might be like, it's time to figure out how we're gonna plant them and what we're gonna plant in. So we need to consider if we're planting for the long term. So we have some, one of the pictures up here is some pumpkins shown or whether it's short term, we're gonna do transplants. Um, and this will help guide us towards what the best container is. 
Um, so if we're looking to build a more permanent bed, um, we're going to be sharing some resources for raised garden beds and what materials you need and how to build them um, that we really love using here at Life Lab, and that will be um, shared with us after this webinar. And um, we wanted to share some of the creative ideas for planting projects with kids. So I would highly suggest searching the web, the internet, and looking through resources for creative ideas. That's what I did and I found some really cool ones. Um, I even suggest checking out your recycling bin because there are some really great ways um, that you can find in there. Uh, and so there's some really fun planting projects to do with kids that are perfect. Um, one of my favorites is painting um, pots. And I have one of these that I painted um, at Life Lab a couple summers ago. Um, we do root view cut. And also we're gonna show you a little video about making paper pots, which is one of my favorites uh, for doing transplants with kids. So up next is our video about painting pots. I mean, paper pots. <laughs> All right, next slide. To roll a paper pot is a strip of newspaper and a small can, small juice can of some kind, um, not the larger size kind. And you want one with a nice concave bottom. It's gonna end up looking like this. You wanna um, mark it either to the top or I wanted a slightly shorter um, paper pot. So I put this little marker of tape around the side and then you just match, match up one edge with that tape marker roll tight 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 like you are rolling sushi and then you're going to fold in your bottom so that it is on that concave bottom i like to press down into the table to make sure it's really secure and well folded in there and then when you take the can out you'll have a paper pot Paper pots are so much fun for kids to start seedlings in. Um, they just make sure to help uh, kids to make sure that the pots are totally filled to the very tippy top of soil. Um, and then you can plant your seeds in there and watch them grow. Once they're big enough to transplant, then you can just dig a hole and you can place that whole paper pot down there in the, in the earth. And, uh, and eventually the paper will decompose and then the roots will just continue to grow down there. But what if you are planting um, into containers instead of straight into the ground? One of the major, major factors to consider when you are um, uh, planting into a container is what kind of container do you have and does it have a good way for water to drain through it? Um, if your container already has holes in the bottom, then that's totally great. The water has a direction of flow. There isn't any risk of overwatering the plant. But if you're using some of these containers that are you know, recycled or as Grace was recommending, you know, look through your recycling bin. I love that these tea containers in this picture. Um, but what if it doesn't have any holes? Well, you have some options. You can take a drill or something that you can poke some holes into it um, right there in the bottom, make your own drainage. Um, but you can also make yourself a watering schedule and make sure that you just don't overwater. Um, succulents in particular do very well in containers um, that don't have drainage uh, because you can kind of let them go for a while. You can kind of neglect them a little bit and they'll do, do totally fine. Um, or you can fill a container with some uh, gravel or uh, stones and things at the bottom and that will allow any excess water to be in the bottom and you can actually see when you're overwatering and it won't let your soil get too soggy or too too gross for the plant. So um, also a thing that I do is I actually have a, <laughs> I have, you know, a pot with holes right here in a pot that I like a little bit better with no holes. And so I just make sure to take it out and uh, water it outside or, or in the sink when I need to. Yeah, next slide. Grace is gonna tell us about some other things to keep in mind. Sweet. Another thing to keep in mind is like the size of your plant uh, when you're planting. So you can check out your seed packets. Here we have Renee's garden has seeds and you can check out the either the label on the seed packet if you're planting from seeds or if you are taking a transplant, you can check out um, a lot of times there's like a little piece of paper or um, it's uh, one of the tabs or labels to share with you how big the plant is. So we can see this lemon tree if it's a dwarf lemon tree, that container is probably perfect.
but if it was a full grown lemon tree, we might need to be planting it into the ground. So it's always a good idea to do a little bit of research um, to figure out how big the full grown um, size will be and what container you'd need. Next slide. Cool. Thanks, Grace. Um, also, something that I love about winter is that it's a great time to just start planning the fun elements of your garden. Um, it's a good time to be thinking about fun, freshness, new things to do, um, and to plan it out with your kids, make it a little bit more whimsical and fun. It's a good time to start working on building projects or um, decorating projects, because just because there's less planting to do, so you can focus on other aspects of the garden. Um, or to focus on your indoor garden. Um, if you're doing some early winter or some spring cleaning um, and you're doing some sorting, you might have found some containers or fun objects around the house that would be really great for planting in. Um, so is there anything that you can recycle and make into a fun element of your garden? I personally have my own little like baby shoe right here and this lives outside and I, yeah, just love the whimsy of this. I also have my little plant planter in a teacup with actually a little mushroom house right here. So find ways to decorate and make it, make it interesting. Next slide. So fun. I brought my teacup with a plant in it too, Kara. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of these, this plant, this is a little succulent and it actually lives in my room. So when we're thinking about bringing garden plants indoors. It's so fun to have all of the gorgeous colors and the, come into our living spaces, especially now that we're spending so much more time he, um, at our homes. It's like a really big treat. And so one thing to keep in mind is like growing seedlings indoors can be pretty challenging. So if you don't have the correct sunlight, as you can see in the one picture where the plants are kind of growing like this, um, it is a really good reminder for us to kind of get back to the basics of what plants need. So we can remember that plants need sun, they need soil, they need water, and they need air. Um, and so making sure that when we're growing things inside, they're still getting access to all of those. So thinking back on what Kara was talking about with watering, when we water, we need to make sure that there's something underneath. So here I have a plant and I put a little saucer underneath to help catch the, um, the water, because we don't want to ruin any of the surfaces that we're putting the plants on. So if you have a wooden surface um, and then you're watering and there's holes, then there's going to be a lot of water all over your, your indoor spaces. Um, so plastic saucers, plates, um, you can, again, go and look inside your recycling bin and find some great uh, resources there for helping catch um, some water. Um, one thing that I wanted to note is that if you use the terracotta, um, a lot of times the, the pots like this come with another saucer that um, condensation tends to get kind of gathered underneath and can also damage your indoor surfaces. So even though it can be sort of tricky to start seeds indoors, it's super fun for kids to watch the seeds come up and grow and explore what is happening under the ground and see those roots. So one of my favorite containers to plant in is root view cups. Um, and that's a great way to explore. Yeah, there's one right there, Kara. Um, so we're gonna be sharing more re resources on how to make root view cups um, and a video of how to do it with kids. So. Yeah, we're ready for the next slide. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, exactly, Grace. It is sometimes hard to grow seedlings inside, but don't be bummed if you don't grow the perfect transplant because you can always buy them at the garden center. Um, and there's so many helpful resources online. These are just a few of the resources that I found that really outline how to plan for garden designing with kids, as well as examples of different kinds of beds or containers. These links will be, um, or these links to these sites will also be on our resources page that we'll email out after this. And up next, we want to share a video that Grace, my lovely co-presenter, made about soil, the stuff beneath our feet, and how to tell um, what kind of soil you might have in your garden. Oh no, we don't have sound. Activity called the nitty gritty. Are you ready? Let's go. What have you noticed when walking around? Have you ever paid attention to the soil beneath your feet? The texture, the color, the smell, the wetness, the squishiness? Take a look around. 
soil may be different in different places. So one way that we can categorize our soil is by looking at the different materials that it's made up of. So the first thing is we got to get our jar. Um, and this was an old um, container with food in it. And I cleaned it off so that I could see it. And now I'm going to just take the empty jar and I'm going to find some soil like this that I found here at the park. And I'm going to just fill it up about two thirds of the way full. Really, you can explore and try and find whatever soil is around you. All right, and now we're gonna, now that we have our soil, we're gonna fill it up all, almost all of the way. I'm gonna take the lid and put it on really tight. Now it's time to shake it. place to put our soil and then we're going to wait 24 hours and observe and watch it change. Now that we have described our soil, we are going to get a chance to get to identify the different parts of our soil and make a drawing in our nature journals. So I am going to use my nature journal and if you don't have your nature journal, if you don't have one, you can either make one or you could just get a piece of paper and use that. That's totally fine. And the first thing we're going to do is open it up to the first free page in our in our journal. And we're going to draw our jar. Okay, so take a minute to draw your jar. Your jar might look something like this. It might also look a little bit different. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and identify how far down is where our soil starts. So I'm seeing that there's a there's a lot of water in here before Right here is where my soil in my jar starts. So I'm gonna draw that line on here, just like this. And above it, I know that there's water. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some blue marks on my paper to represent that there's water above. Just like this. Now, at the top, where the smallest particles of our soil is, is gonna be the clay. And I'm noticing that there's a little ribbon of the really small particles right at the top. So I'm going to again take my marker and I am going to mark a line that shows a little small ribbon that represents the clay. And in that, I am going to have it be purple. I'm going to use my purple marker and I'm going to make lines that go up and down so that I can tell which one is which. And next to it, I'm going to write clay so that I remember that this line represents my clay. So next, I'm gonna look at my soil and I'm gonna look all the way down and it is most of the soil that represents silt. I'm gonna say almost all the way till right about here is silt. So this whole area is silt. So I'm gonna use another color and this time I am gonna use this pink. And I am gonna draw another line to show where the approximate line, I'm not exactly sure, but this is, what it seems to be about. And I am gonna draw diagonal lines. And next to it, I'm gonna write silt. Just like this. Now, I can see at the bottom, the biggest part particles, the biggest parts, the pieces, are at the bottom, and that is sand. So at the bottom, I'm gonna draw dots to represent sand. And I am gonna use my green marker. I'm going to write sand. This is sort of what mine looks like. And if you wanted to, rather than using polka dots and lines, you could shade it in with a color. Um, you could do whatever you want so that you can see the ribbons or the lines that your clay, your silt, and your sand make up. Now that we got to take our soil sample and we got to learn about what is inside of our soil and what makes it up. I am going to leave you the question. What kinds of plants do you think would like to grow in your soil? Thank you so much for doing this activity with me. Let's all take a deep breath and let it out. And you can go and thank a plant. Have a wonderful day. See you later, scientists.
Awesome. Thanks for joining and watching this video. Up next, we are going to explore some soil a little bit closer with Daniela talking to us about how to enrich our soil today. Thank you, Grace. And yeah, hi everyone. I'm Daniela Echegaray. Hola a todas y todos. And I'm the bilingual garden educator at Life Lab. So yes, whether you're planting in the ground or in pots like we just saw, enriching your soil and prepping it for planting is key for your garden to thrive. And it's a great thing to do now in the winter so that when spring comes, plants can take up all those nutrients and grow healthy and strong. So in the soil shake video that Grace showed us, she taught us a very simple and fun way to explore what our soil is made up of. And in every garden, we're going to find different proportions of clay, silt, and sand. So what to do if your soil has a lot of clay in it? Well, you can add compost to the soil in your garden. And what to do if your soil is very sandy? In this case, you can add some compost to your soil. And how about if your soil has a lot of silt in it? You guessed it, yep, you can add compost. So compost is always a great option to add to your soil and it's broken down organic matter that can be taken up by plants and turned into delicious organic matter in the form of fruits, vegetables, or whatever you decide to grow. And it can also help with the structures of soil. So prepping garden beds is definitely one of my favorite things to do with kids. It's a lot of fun for them and for, and for me. And while prepping beds, uh, it might be that your kids just rather play with dirt sometime, and that's great. It's definitely an important first step for your future gardeners. And for kids who are wanting to get involved in prepping beds with you, I'm gonna show you some tips up next. And next slide, please. Your garden looks anything like this bed there's gonna be some extra steps to take before we enrich our soil. It's a great opportunity for kids to help clear out beds and they get to explore the roots and plants that are usually not visible. Kids can help by pulling out the toughest plants, just like this one. If you're not pulling out all of the plants in your garden, Another good idea is to mark them with anything you have handy so that it's clear. There we go. Now that you and the kids have taken those weeds out, it's great for kids to help sift and compost. I've seen kids of all ages enjoy sifting compost so much that some of them are happy to sift or compost. There's many types of sifters you can use. For younger kids, plastic nursery trays with small holes like this one work great. And you can place them on wheelbarrows or any other tubs or containers that you have. Kids love spreading shovelfuls of compost on the sifter. They really like doing that. So have them spread the compost on top then to sift, they can use their hand to gently move the compost through the holes. Another way to sift compost is to take the tray or the sifter and just shake it through the top so that compost can go through. Make sure that kids get to see their progress by feeling and smelling the sifted compost that they have. One of the most exciting and appealing aspects of sifting compost is a variety of little friends that we can find on the way. We have the weeds out, we have sifted compost. It's time to loosen up the soil and feed it with compost. Depending on how compacted your soil is and how deep your garden beds are, you and any older kids 
can use big digging forks to loosen up that extra compacted soil so that when young gardeners come help, they can actually work on the soil and help breaking it up. Have kids spread a layer of sifted compost all over the garden beds. Then use a hand spade or a hand fork and break up the soil. This way we're also incorporating the compost into the soil. Kids love breaking up clumps of dirt, so invite them to do so. Once the soil is loose and soft, invite kids to even the soil of your garden. I am not sure why, but kids around the world love patting down soil. They can make it very compacted. If this is the case for your kids, you can remind them that roots want soil to be very fluffy and soft so that they can go through it. And they can imagine their fingers being roots. Can my roots go through the soil? Or do we need to make our soil more fluffy and soft? When I talk to kids about mulching, I like to tell them that we're putting our garden to bed now that it's cold, so that in the springtime, when it starts getting warmer, we can wake it up again and start planting. I have this straw here that we can use as mulch, but you can also use any other dry materials, just like this one, or any dry leaves that you might have from the fall. Let's work on making that long blanket for our bed. Just make sure that you put a thick layer of mulch on top of your garden bed so that you can keep the moisture in and you can prevent weeds from popping up again. Also, you're adding more organic matter to your bed. That's great. All right, so those are some tips for prepping beds with the kids. And up next, I'm gonna pass it on to Kara, who's going to talk about what we can plant now. Thanks so much, Daniela. Um, yeah, that's such good information. Now that the beds are prepped and it's all ready for spring planting, um, let's talk about what you can plant directly into the ground during winter. I've made a video to kind of highlight a couple different methods for um, planting directly in the ground and what you can do right now in wintertime. Um, so let's go ahead and play that. Perfect. Hey friends, Kara from Life Lab here. I'm going to be doing some winter seed planting which doesn't seem like something that, that we can do a lot of is planting seeds in winter, but um, luckily I live in a very mild climate here in Santa Cruz. And uh, the, at this point, the ground isn't really getting frozen too much. So I can do some, some seed sowing right into the ground. Some that I'm starting with is I'm just gonna scatter some uh, very small seeds right along the surface. This is a good time to scatter those small seeds and to see what comes up. So I'm gonna start with a lettuce mix with very, very tiny, tiny seeds, perfect for scattering along the surface of the ground. And if I'm doing this with kids, I like to think of scattering seeds as I'm the seed fairy, and we are just scattering seeds and seeing what comes up in the, in the summertime or the springtime. So with these little seeds, I'll just scatter around here, scatter around here. If I really, really want to get into this uh, seed fairy theme, I can even dance the seeds into the ground and this is a really good time to start planting some wildflowers. Um, a lot of wildflowers naturally get dropped um, from wildflower plants in the fall or sometimes in the winter and um, in a really mild climate like this we can just start scattering our wildflowers for a nice spring bloom. But again we want to use pretty small seeds for that scattering business. 
I have some Clarkia here, some mountain garland Clarkia, but I could also use the Jella, poppies, any little little tiny seeds like that. And again, I'm going to scatter. So now I've got my little seeds scattered, but there's also some seeds that we want to be a little bit more intentional about. We want to put them directly into the ground and they can go directly into the ground um, as long as you know, we're sort of past that, that ground freezing or, the, or that frost. So I've got some beets here, love beets. Basically any roots that you want to eat, like carrots, radishes, beets, um, those want to be directly sown into the ground because they don't do quite as well transplanted. They want to go directly into the ground because they are concentrating on growing their nice big roots. They want to get started exactly where they're going to grow so those roots can grow nice and deep and big. So for my bee here, take a little hole and then just go ahead and put that seed right in there. So anyway, that's my bee. But I have another experiment that I'm really excited to try. And this is a really, really, really fun thing to do with kids, is that I have some leftover food scraps that have seeds in it. We had some spaghetti squash last night for dinner, and so we dug out those innards, and we've got some really nice innards full of seeds here. And this is some really great winter planting experiments. It can be a great lesson for kids to show them, you know, it's both food that we eat, and also um, those seeds can regenerate into more food that we eat directly from something that you're eating. So I'm going to dig a nice big hole for these this little squash seeds because they are a little bit on the bigger side. But you don't have to be fancy about this. You can just really take a, a lump of squash innards or, or tomato innards or whatever it is that you're planting. And I'm just sticking it right in there. Those innards will start to decompose, but then who knows, maybe some of those seeds will also pop up in the springtime. So I'm excited to see if that experiment turns out. And one other direct seeding experiment that we love to do with kids here at Life Lab is we play a game called Sneaky Seeds. And you can do this with basically any seeds that you have around, maybe some leftover seed packets that you didn't get to plant last year, or some of the food scraps. Um, I am actually using this popcorn cob that was grown in this field behind me. And if we're playing uh, Sneaky Seeds with the kids, what we do is you know, grab a few seeds and then say, we're gonna go into the garden and just really plant them anywhere. We're not going to worry about depth or ex its exact location. This is about sort of helping our garden to have more fun volunteers popping up in unusual places. So with my little sneaky seeds, I would tell the kids, let's be as sneaky as possible. Let's find any spots that call to us. This spot might work. They can put it right there. This spot. I'm really excited actually about <laughs> this plot of ground because lettuce or clarkia wildflowers or squash or popcorn might pop up here. It's part of the fun of winter planting. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Hi friend. Me. <laughs> I had fun making that video and planting all those things and we'll see what pops up in that field. Um, and so I got a chance to talk about what can go directly into the ground right now but of course, a lot of our plants that we um, want to grow up nice and big in springtime or even some of our summer plants we can get started now, but those want to get um, those want to get sewn into uh, like starting our early spring garden into little containers. So I'll let Amy take it from here, telling us how best to do that. Thank you, Kara. Um, just one more note on sneaky seeds. I've had so much fun doing that with kids and um, my daughter caught on and would sneak to do sneaky seeds um, with her friend. They would sneak into the garage where they know I kept the seeds and take them out and go plant them wherever they wanted in the in the yard, in the garden. And I loved it. I'd look out the window and I'd be like, oh, they're doing sneaky seeds. And then one March, while there was still frost on the ground, a pumpkin plant came up and um, roofers were trucking by it and everything. I thought there's no way this is going to survive frost and roofers and everything, but it totally did and made the most amazing pumpkins that summer. Um, so you never know what's going to happen when you do sneaky seeds. Um, now, if you want to um, have some transplants for your spring garden, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, early spring gardening um, transplants that you can start now. Um, so right now we're, we're looking at cold weather crops. Um, here on the central coast, we can, um, it's time to start starts for kale, chard, peas, broccoli, things like that that want to grow in the cooler weather of the early spring. Um, and so um, 
what you need to do that. Oh, and I want to also start by saying it is completely okay to just buy your transplants and put them in your garden. Um, uh, you could buy all your transplants, you could grow all your transplants, or you could do a mix of both. I always do a mix of both. I grow tons of transplants, but I, there are certain plants I like to grow this, uh, grow this, uh, grow the starts for, and some, certain plants that I like to buy them. Um, so here we are. We're going to plant some peas, and really all you need to do this is you need the right kind of soil. It's called seed starting mix or seedling mix. Um, it definitely is very worth it to buy the right kind of soil. Um, any garden center. And then you need containers. I really like to use just reused old six packs. Um, and I like to use um, just reused um, plastic nursery trays. Wow, it's not letting you see that nursery tray. That's the same thing that Daniela was using to sift compost. Um, and basically you just need containers and you need them in a tray so that you can move them. We'll talk more about why you'd be moving them in a minute. Um, so if that's yogurt cups with holes punched in the bottom with a hammer and a nail and you put them in a cookie sheet, that'll work. Um, like Grace said, investigate your recycling and see what's there. Um, I like to I like to plant in things that have um, separate places for each plant to grow because then it's really easy to pull them out and plant them in the garden without their roots being all tangled up with each other. Um, okay, so we've got our, our container and our tray and we've got our soil and we've got some seeds and these are sugar snap peas. And this is the way I like to plant when I'm planting with kids and when I'm planting on my own because I find it really easy to stay organized and get things to the right depth. I like to put uh, two or three seeds on top in each cell and lay them all out before I poke anything down because otherwise I will forget where I have planted things and where I haven't yet. Um, so there I have two or three seeds on the top. Now I don't actually want two or three plants to grow in each of these cells. But I don't want any empty cells either. So if more than one plant grows up in each cell, I will just take the smaller ones and snip them off at the base. That way the biggest, strongest one can have the space it needs to grow and I won't disturb its roots by trying to separate them or anything like that. Mm. I'll just snip them off. So this is some kale plants that I planted last week. And in a couple of the cells, there are two of them. So I'll just, I'll just um, thin out the smaller plants um, pretty soon here. So, okay, so I've got my peas right on the surface. My seed packet says they should go one inch. So I'll look at my finger and I'll be like, huh, okay, one inch is just past my first knuckle. When I, if I was doing this with kids, I would look at their fingers and I would say, huh, one inch on you is probably down to your first or your second knuckle. So go ahead and poke the seeds down until it gets um, to that second knuckle is what I would tell kids to do. So for me, it's gonna be just past my first. So I'm just gonna poke down each set of seeds to the right depth and cover them up. And then I'll take them outside to water. And you want a watering can that has um, a you know, sprinkler top, quite a number of holes. This is one um, that I just made out of a milk jug just by drilling a bunch of holes in the lid. Um, and that'll give a sprinkling quality to your water. You don't want a stream of water because that will just knock seeds out of place. Um, these milk jug watering cans are great too for being able to have um, a, a watering jug for each kid if you're working with multiple kids. It's easy to make lots of watering jugs that way. Um, so I'm going to take them outside, water them, and then bring them back in. And I have a towel laid out in my dining room and I have all my, um, my starts sitting in there. And they're going to live there until they pop up. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on them every day. I'm going to keep taking them outside and making sure that they're evenly, uh, evenly moist and um, keep them watered. And then when they pop up, that's when everything's going to change. That's when they're still going to be living inside my dining room at night, but in the daytime, they're going to be outside in full direct sunlight all day long, every day. Um, that's something that I can do here on the central coast. Um, it's, it does get down, I live in the mountains and it gets down to 30 degrees or below at night. And so I'll wait till nine or 10 in the morning to take them outside. But then I leave them outside in full direct sunlight all day. Seedlings really need that to grow stout and strong. You can see these seedlings are about, about as wide as they are tall and that's what you want. Um, and a, seedlings can't quite get that strength or length of light in a window. Um, and so you want to take them outside. Now, if you live in a colder climate and it's going to be freezing temperatures all day long, then obviously that method's not going to work. And you're going to need to look into um, either getting a simple home uh, grow light set up at your local nursery um, 
or building a, you can find resources online about building a, a simple cold frame for your yard where you can pop them in there in the day and keep them warmer so they can get the light that they need. Um, so that's where to keep them, um, inside at night, outside in the day. Now when they are ready to transplant, they will be looking like the seedlings that you would have bought at the garden center. Um, and so you'll, you'll recognize that look about them. And when, when you're getting ready to transplant them, you need to do something called hardening them off, which is basically just a fancy term for them getting used to the nighttime temperatures before they have the shock of being transplanted. So you're going to leave them outside around the clock for three or four days before you transplant them into the ground. That way it's like baby steps, one thing at a time. Okay, first I'm getting used to the nighttime temperatures. Okay, now I'm getting the shock of being transplanted. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm all right. I did one thing at a time. It's good. Um, okay, and then like I said, thinning, um, you always want to thin down to one or at the maximum two plants per cell, depending on what it is. Kale or chard can survive if you leave two in a cell. Um, one is probably still best. And you want to do that before you're ready to transplant. Um, Okay, so if you have any questions about that, please pop them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and I also just want to say buying transplants is great too. I find growing them really rewarding and you might as well, um, but it is also not cheating at all to just buy plants and put them into your, your garden or your container. Okay, so Nikki, we're going to go back to our slides because I want to let you know what's coming up next. We have um, another garden webinar coming up on March 23rd that's about spring gardening um, and um, so that's March 23rd we'll, we'll talk to you about how to really get your full springtime garden going um, also in that slide that Nikki just showed there is the kids gardening book um, and well, it's called the Book of Gardening Projects for Kids, but it's really a book about gardening as a family. And it has so much good information, so much inspiration, recipes, um, just fun, fun ideas in there. So that is available at lifelab.org slash store. Um, so that's on our website if you're interested in getting a copy of that for your family or if, as a gift. Um, and so there's the webinar, there is the book, and then there also is a resource web page on lifelab.org that we just created today with lots of family gardening resources for you, more information on all of the things that we've talked about today. Okay, so we are ready to answer some questions if we've got some of those. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Daniela for letting us know what questions you've got. Thanks, Amy, that was great information. And we actually have two questions in the chat. Um, so we have one from Amy Cody and it's about planting broccoli seeds. So um, I'm gonna read it. Do you find that broccoli does better planted in the early fall? I find that in the Santa Clara Valley, it bolts too quickly and attracts pests as a spring summer crop. So um, Amy, do you wanna answer that question? I can attempt to answer it. And then um, Jennifer might be a good person to know more. Um, you know, broccoli is one of those cold weather crops. So, um, so it could be something you plant now or in early fall, either one, it likes the spring or the fall, but it doesn't really, um, it's not really a summertime mm. hot weather crop or it probably will bolt early, meaning it's gonna open up and lots, make lots of flowers and get bitter and not good to eat. Um, uh, and so, yeah, either one of those, spring spring or fall and with broccoli the one the one thing that i have learned is that it needs a lot of fer fertility it needs a lot of compost in the soil um, because that's how you get the actual head of broccoli um, if it if there's not enough nutrients in the soil then you get an itty bitty head of broccoli um, which my friend <laughs> joked about in her garden it was all fairy broccoli <laughs> it was little tiny heads of broccoli <laughs> jennifer do you have anything to add about about when um, when works the best for you to plant broccoli? I, I would just exactly what you said. That's, that's it here on the central coast. I don't, I can't speak to other places, but that's exactly it. Yeah. And then of course, I know in our garden, um, pests eat them. So just, uh, covering them, um, protecting them. Yeah. Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Amy and Jennifer. And we have uh, another question, also from Amy Cody, and it's also about seedlings. So um, this might be a, a good question for Jennifer. Um, well, I actually or... had an answer to that, um, oh. uh, just because it sounds like once seedlings have sprouted in containers, should we water them from the bottom or rather from the top? And that's a great question. Um, there are some plants that you can just sort of leave water in a little saucer and it will like, and the soil will soak up in the containers really nicely. For seedlings though, if you're sprouting seedlings in containers and they're, um, uh, Oh, actually, this could also be a question for Amy in terms of starting little little starts. But I would say that um, if you're if the seeds have just sprouted, their roots aren't very long, and so it'll be very hard for them to to reach down and soak up that that water from the bottom. So from the top is still is still a good good until they're nice and big and robust. Awesome, thank you, Kara. For yeah, to add, and I have a fun thing to add to that, which is that. So you've got your, your sprinkler head watering can. And the way that I like to talk to kids about how we water um, seedlings, especially when they haven't sprouted yet and they're just a tiny little seed. Some, some of the seeds are so tiny and you don't wanna wash them out of place before they even have a chance to sprout. And so I call it sweep and sparkle, the way that we water um, seedlings. So you just sweep the water across. You don't hold your watering can here and get it started over the seedlings because we all know when you're first getting a watering can started, it goes like <laughs> first before it gets a nice spray so you start it over here and you sweep it across and then you stop and you wait for that water you can see it on the surface of the soil and you kind of see it sparkle into the soil as it settles in you want to sweep and see it sparkle in before you add any more because you don't want to flood because floods rinse the seeds out of place yeah amy can i just add i think i um oftentimes think of it like a cloud uh, going over the top of the tray and then gently raining down on the plants. Um, and it's like, it's moving just across like this and then it moves back across. And so it's a nice visual, especially for kids when they're, when you're having them go back and forth. Yeah. And I, and I was just going to say, Kara talked about the bottom up. Um, I think it's also just good practice in general to water from the top down. So you can see water um, come out the bottom, especially if you're growing in something with poles, it's just a nice practice because then um, essentially if you water from the bottom up, then plants are sort of reabsorbing their own nutrients and their own salts over and over and over again. And over time that could be not, that's not so healthy for the plant. So it's just nice to come from the top bottom when you're growing plants with holes in the bottom of the container. Great, thanks. Thanks everyone for answering that question. And we have another question from Elisa Valentin. I hope I'm pronouncing that well. Um, curious what to plant, want, what to plant here now, I think it says, if starting seeds inside and when to transplant. So uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, send that question over to Amy. Yeah, so um, great things to start here now um, are the kale and chard and um, anything in the broccoli family, which would include kale. Kale, collards, broccoli, cauliflower, um, uh, kohlrabi, uh, those types of things um, do really well in cool weather, but also peas. Um, and then those root veggies like radishes and beets and um, root, root veggies like radishes, beets and carrots want to be started directly outside. But all those other ones that I mentioned, you can start inside now. Um, and then when to transplant, um, the rule of thumb I gave earlier was like, well, when it looks like what's at the garden center. But, um, but really like date wise, um, it depends on what zone you're in. Um, in Santa Cruz, things stay more mild and temperate than they do up here where I live in the mountains. So if you're if you're down in Santa Cruz, you can probably get away with um, planting things out. Even I mean, you could probably put kale and chard in the ground right now, but maybe we, Jennifer can speak to that a little bit better. Up here in the mountains, I'd wait a little longer because we get pretty heavy frost here in the winter. Um, and then for warm weather crops like your beans and tomatoes and um, all those other lovely things that we want to grow in the warm weather that I cannot wait to grow. Um, the rule up here where I live is May 1st is, is when we're safe from frost. And I know that's gonna be a lot earlier in Santa Cruz. So it just depends on sort of the microclimate that you're in as well. 
Um, Jennifer, do you want to speak to that too or anybody oh, else? No, you said it so well, Amy. And I, I just want to say we do have kale growing right now and it's growing lovely, uh, but it does have rime or like the, the white floating row cover over it, which in effect creates like a little greenhouse. Um, a microclimate, which the plants really appreciate right now. Um, and it does the frost, you know, it can, we can get a little bit more frost, but no kale down here um, in Santa Cruz, not in the mountains is growing just fine right now. Yeah, we've had enough sunny days.